common frame of reference, if you will, for different parties, different stakeholders, different in, indeed intellectual disciplines, to be able to have a, a, a common starting point, a resource base, if you will, for a more productive conversation about how best to address these kinds of issues. I see today's session and the follow-on piece of work that we're in the midst of uh, developing with Professor Drake uh, with the pen as a uh, basis for taking the same kind of approach, provide a foundational uh, piece of work looking at the landscape, the history, the taxonomy, to provide, a, again, a more fruitful uh, basis, a more informed basis by which to have a discussion on the specific issue of data localization and the treatment of cross-border cross data flows. And what is emerging out of that piece of work is this notion we're going to have as the central a fulcrum for the discussion today is should indeed we be thinking about addressing this issue in a multifaceted or we, what we're referring to here a multi-track way not only the, the traditional approaches of intergovernmental discussions in the trade sphere or otherwise but also by utilizing uh, a multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary process that could uh, encourage better thinking about this issue, but also potentially provide a basis for other, uh, and other geometries, if you will, of parties coming together and uh, developing uh, productive approaches, best practices, good practices, guidelines uh, for policy at a national level going forward. So that's the basic context for the meeting. What I'd like to do before inviting Professor Drake to uh, provide some opening comments based on the research that he has been uh, doing uh, in dialogue with our community is, uh, is to introduce our roundtable participants today. I thank you all for, for being with us. I'm, I apologize a little bit about the, uh, the geometry of, the, of this room, which is not necessarily opti optimal, but we'll try to work uh, through that. I'm going to just uh, introduce you now uh, and then turn it over to, to Bill. Fiona Alexander who's Associate Administrator, Office of International Affairs at NTIU of the U.S. Government's Department of Commerce. Fiona is... Can they raise their hands? Perhaps? Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, uh, Vinton Cerf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist of Google, whom you all will know. Professor uh, Bill Drake, International Fellow and Lecturer of the University of Zurich. Is Raul Echeverria here? Raul is here, Vice President of Global Engagement for Internet Society. Thanks for being uh, with us. Henriette uh, Esterhuizen, Director for Global Policy and Strategy of Association for Progressive Communications. Is Henriette uh, yeah, here? Okay, very good. Uh, Torbjorn Fredriksson, who uh, he's on home turf here, Head of the ICT Analysis Section Division on Technology and Logistics here at UNCTAD. Uh, Goran Marby, President and CEO of ICANN. Ricardo Melendez-Ortiz, CEO of the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, who, like me, has just made the trip back from Buenos Aires and the WTO. Maretka Schatke, member of the European Parliament of the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us. Thomas Schneider, Vice President, uh, Federal Office of Communications, as Thomas arrived, of the government of Switzerland. Yes, thank you, our host here. Lee Tuttle. Uh, Counselor, Trade and Services Division, WTO. Uh, Mary Uduma, Managing Director, Jayuno uh, Digital Solutions, Nigeria. Thank you. And Hong Zhui, Professor and Director of the Institute for Internet Policy and Law at Normal University, uh, China. So we, we're going to split the discussion into two basic parts. The first will be just taking a look at the landscape of how how is uh, data localization occurring currently, what, uh, what approaches are being pursued, how effective um, may they be, and we have some uh, specific uh, uh, information to put on the table, and we'll get a little bit of a discussion among the roundtable participants around that piece, and then we will take a look at some of the suggested approaches about this multi-track notion in the second half hour of the discussion again with roundtable participants, and then for the final third of the, of the segment here, we'll open it up for a room-wide discussion. So with that, Professor Drake. Thank you very much, Rick, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so this is not a very propitious uh, setting, obviously, for a roundtable. Um, so, but we've <laughs> we've managed to cluster most of our, our speakers, I think, here in the middle section. So hopefully everybody can see them, uh, even if you're in the back. So uh, as Rick indicated, this has been a project that's been running for a while now. We've had several meetings under the aegis of the WEF over the past year with a number of different stakeholders, and we've also had sessions that we did at the WISIS Forum and the Eurodig, and now here in order to do broader outreach with people. And the basic idea is that digital trade is becoming an increasingly prominent part of the global policy agenda. Uh, it is something that's being pursued fairly, I guess you could say aggressively or with, with some, some uh, focus by many governments, particularly in the industrialized world, but also others as well. Um, and as that's proceeding, at the same time, we've had an internet governance set of dialogues and the community around internet governance slowly sort of catching up and going, wow, there's things going on in the trade space, maybe we should be connecting with this and so on. So what we're really trying to do is sort of bring together these two different worlds. We did an open forum this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, for UNCTAD where we talked about this uh, a bit, and this is sort of building on the conversation that we had there, and I, the number of you were there, I know. So um, just to background the issue very quickly, uh, data flows are becoming absolutely central to the global economy. The McKinsey Global Institute uh, did a study pointing out that from 2005 to 2012, data flows accounted for $2.8 trillion of global GDP, and data, is gro data flows growing faster than trade in goods. Uh, much of the world's data, 90% uh, or so it's estimated, uh, that's out there now has been created in the past couple of years. Uh, and data flows are becoming key to the way global value chains work in a variety of economic sectors. It's key to the industrial internet, the internet of things, or the internet of everything, depending on which company you're talking to. Uh, and it's becoming central to growth and wealth creation in a wide variety of contexts. And uh, micro and uh, small, medium-sized enterprises as well are accessing global platforms uh, and markets via uh, the digital environment. Next slide, please. Yet, while that is happening, many governments are increasingly looking to project territorial authority onto the internet uh, and requiring, putting new requirements on data, um, particularly uh, Many countries are, have rules that require that data be locally stored or resident. It may be broadly gauged or may be, may be more narrowly gauged, but that's a reasonably common proposition in a number of economic sectors and sometimes on a, a macro basis. There are other countries, though, that have gone beyond that, that are requiring that data be processed by entities located within their national jurisdiction, and sometimes, indeed, that it be processed by national suppliers, often uh, in conformity with unique national standards, which are not the global standards. In some cases, uh, these policies also include restrictions on the cross-border movement of certain categories of data or the prior consent uh, of such uh, transmissions or, indeed, sometimes outright bans. There have also been countries that have contemplated reorganizing their network architecture, their, quote, segment of the Internet, as the Russian government likes to say, to ensure that data is routed locally within their space uh, as much as possible. Next slide, please. So we've seen a lot of variations in these kind of policies, as I say. I don't want to go through all the details of this, but um, clearly for national security and law enforcement, uh, there have been a lot of regulations, financial, health information, and more generally personal information of various sorts. Sometimes, as I say, it's a cross-sectoral type of approach, and sometimes it's a matter of pre-digital policies that required that data be resident. I mean, many countries uh, require, for example, that uh, companies keep their books uh, on their premises to be checked, et cetera. The motivations for these policies vary. Um, sometimes it's uh, absolutely defensible things like ensuring accountability and prudential requirements, uh, ensuring law enforcement access, but sometimes it also goes to broader, and privacy, but sometimes it also goes to broader uh, types of approaches where governments are seeking to surveil their, their data environment in their country or have, quote, cyber sovereignty and a techno-industrial policy, et cetera, to advance their interests at the expense of others, uh, the expense, the interests of particular uh, providers. 
Uh, the incidence of this, it varies again, but uh, some countries uh, are very prominent examples, China, Russia, Indonesia, Vietnam. Uh, there have been uh, proposals in Nigeria and partially enacted as far as I can tell, uh, Turkey, uh, other places as well. Um, estimates vary though on these things uh, and there have been various efforts to try to uh, take stock of this. The OECD did a paper that counted 41 countries that had residency requirements. Uh, the European Commission counted uh, 21 even just within the EU. So you, you see the differences there. Next slide. Cross-border data flow also, sometimes there are barriers to data flow which are not simply a function of data localization requirements. Uh, many countries, of course, uh, with regard to personally identifiable information are imposing laws and regulations now. Over 100 countries have got uh, rules put in place. Um, and very often these require a completely legitimate purpose, of course. Uh, very often these require an adequacy assessment of the recipient country to make sure that data is protected. But it's also possible in some cases that privacy policies can be used as a rationale to essentially uh, prohibit data from, from moving uh, for economic purposes as well. This is a controversial point, but sometimes it may happen. Um, other forms of uh, restrictions on data flow, obviously censorship, which takes many forms. Um, and then, of course, there's been much discussion in trade circles of digital protectionism. There's no agreed definition on this, but there's certainly many types of non-technical barriers, including technical standards, uh, procedures, and so on, that impose limitations on platforms, applications, services, systems, etc. cetera. Um, and again, uh, estimates of the incidence of this vary, but it, it seems that uh, at least the OECD counts, 75 countries that have uh, restrictions, uh, or 75 restrictions in 59 countries based on privacy protection, uh, including 14 countries that simply prohibit the transfer of data. Next slide, please. Um, and these policies impact broadly everybody, obviously. Uh, they impact multinational suppliers and users, they impact national suppliers and users in different economic sectors, small, medium-sized micro-enterprises, civil society, the technological and economic trajectory of the country, studies have been done that show that GDP is reduced uh, in a number of countries by the prevalence of these kinds of policies. One could also raise concerns from the standpoint of norms and values, human rights and the right of customers to be able to get services from wherever they want, et cetera. Uh, and there are concerns about whether or not this fragments the internet to some extent. Next slide. So in response to this, there have been proposals in the trade environment and um, the, the general agreement on trade services of the WTO has some language that is relevant but is broadly cast and has been debated. Um, more recently, a number of bespoke uh, provisions on this language, uh, on these issues have been put forward. Most notable has been the TPP, now the CPTPP, uh, which is quite a mouthful, uh, which requires, uh, put certain requirements for uh, localization and barriers to data flow that says that these, any policies that are pursued must not be applied in a manner that would uh, constitute uh, arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination or disguise restrictions on trade or that impose uh, restrictions greater than are required to achieve a legitimate national objective. Um, and the WTO, as we know, next slide, just had its meeting in Buenos Aires where 70 countries agreed to begin to pursue trade uh, on digital issues, uh, trade rules on digital issues. The question on the table, though, for us is, can trade rules alone suffice to deal with these kinds of issues? There are clearly political problems around trade, with the views of governments that may not be sold on the idea that you should have a ban on data localization or limitations of any sort. There's opposition from the kind of usual suspects uh, from the, in the trade world that uh, oppose certain types of trade provisions. And then there's the unusual suspects from the internet governance world uh, who also have concerns based on the kinds of uh, experiences they have in multi-stakeholder settings that are transparent and open and inclusive which is very different from what goes on in trade negotiations. Uh, and many have substantive concerns about these issues as well. And finally, just to note that there are institutional aspects about trade, using trade here. Uh, the very fact of negotiating binding treaty-based uh, uh, agreements subject to possible sanctions for violations changes the negotiation dynamics in some important ways. 
Um, and there's the possibilities of uh, issues being bundled together and linked, people trading off, saying I won't have an open internet unless you give me concessions in the market for bananas or whatever it may be in an uh, extraneous area. And it's a slow and difficult process to do trade. So these are the kinds of issues we are putting on the table for uh, as background. And what we wanted to do then is get views from people. We've got a very multi-stakeholder um, panel of people from all sectors uh, on the, nat the nature of these problems and whether they feel trade policy is a sufficient response to this. Thanks a lot, Bill. So just to throw to open the discussion now to our roundtable participants, for this segment, how serious a problem do people feel this data localization phenomenon is? Um, what motivates, you know, what, what are the legitimate and sometimes what you might consider to be less legitimate motivations for this, because it's important to understand why this is happening if you want to address it uh, well. And how effective do we think the current instruments and approaches, and Bill put the question rather pointedly, how, how fit for purpose is the trade regime to, to address these issues? I invite anyone who would like to uh, comment on those or other issues uh, just to indicate uh, by raising their their arm, I suppose, and we'll just take some quick comments through the roundtable. Vint? Yes. Yeah. It's Vint. I'll dive in uh, where angels fear to tread. Uh, let me start out just by saying, if, if, as I approach this set of questions, my first question is always, who are the interested parties and what are their interests? What incentives might they have for choosing one policy or another? The second one, a question that I would have, uh, is what potential hazards or collateral uh, impact or collateral damage might various policies have on, uh, on the open uh, interconnection of the Internet? Uh, and third, uh, one of the things I would worry about is whether the analogies one tries to draw from the physical world uh, would turn out to be inappropriate uh, for uh, implementation. I mean, there are, as you look at trade uh, manifests of uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call them, the uh, big uh, trading, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank, what are those big boxes that uh, the ships uh, move around? The containers, yeah, I should know that. A container is also a computer science idea. I don't know why I'm losing that. Anyway, the question is whether the container of, uh, of the shipping world and the container of the computer science world uh, share only a name and no other characteristic uh, worthy of attention. So I raise those not so much as answers, uh, but uh, as a desire to gather information before coming to any conclusions about uh, adoption of one policy or another. Mm. Thank you. Helpful. Lee? Hi, yeah, I just, um, looking at the sort of effectiveness issues uh, of the questions you posed, and I have three quick points. One, that um, I think an awful lot of rules exist already, and I think it's a myth that we don't have rules already, um, so the question is, you know, what else might be needed, I if anything, and if uh, you, uh, as dispute settlement panels have determined, they see an awful lot of technological neutrality. We don't get at the level of detail in the WTO that, that, that national laws get into. So we have less of a problem of trying to, as you mentioned, the analog laws now might not work. Uh, second, trade is a tiny part of the overall picture. I don't think we will ever be the whole picture. And we're probably, if uh, some proponents would get what they want, we'd be moving in the direction of an open internet. Um, and what do, what do uh, Internet people need to know about uh, the WTO? I think I've spoken at previous IGFs and tried to say that you need to understand for a lot of the very important issues, uh, the exceptions provisions uh, of the GATT and the GATS in particular. It talks about privacy and it sets the standards for rules that are made um, that can, if they need to, even break the WTO. And this is what people in the Internet community need to know about trade. What trade people want to know is the solutions that are being proposed, how damaging might they be to trade? And would they overshoot the mark? And thirdly, um, 
I think what, from what I've seen, there's a myth that the, 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 the ideas being circulated in the trade world are all out there to benefit the big multinationals or the, what is it, GAFA, it keeps changing. Yeah, there's, depending on who you put in the acronym, it keeps changing. And uh, from the work we do with our member governments, many of them very small and, and many of them developing, um, my take on this, and it's a personal take, is the F SMEs will benefit an awful lot more by the predictability of having some basic principles um, for uh, uh, data barriers and trade that, that involves data than the big uh, companies will because the, the cost of data localization, the cost of other data barriers is just much more prohibitive for the small companies in developing countries than it is for the big companies. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a very useful discussion. And if the question concretely is, can trade rules alone suffice? My answer would be no. And I think we need to begin to address, especially for the people who don't live in the trade world, uh, to begin to explain how trade negotiations and agreements generally work or are intended to work. Because I run into a misunderstanding by a lot of people, not least in civil society, that only when there is an agreement, trade is facilitated. But trade is there, with or without rules around it. And I believe that the public interest is better served when there is a frame of rules around that trade, including the increasingly digital trade, which presents us with new challenges and new questions about, you know, jurisdiction, uh, globally operating companies, uh, you know, what is the foundation in the law, etc. So I do not think that um, trade agreements will be setting norms as such. I think they will be translating for example, let's take the EU, where I work on the European level as the example. We have data protection, net neutrality, intellectual property principles, to name a few. They are embedded in EU law. But what I do think is useful is to integrate then those standards in trade agreements, from my point of view, with the aim to increase those standards, to make them higher also in developing economies, to make them uh, leading to a level playing field for the SMEs operating uh, in, in the global trade, let's say from the EU to a third country or from a third country to the EU. So the way in which we should not understand trade rules is in seeking the middle of the road between two sides, so watering down what's a high standard or lifting up what's a low standard, uh, but rather coming to an agreement uh, of, of what is a shared uh, set of principles and standards, and I also don't think trade rules should be understood as inevitably leading to the lowest common denominator. And if you look at it from that point of view, then I think the question, can trade rules alone suffice? The answer to that is clearly no. But can they play an important role in creating a predictable standard setting level playing field? My answer would be yes. Thank you. Raoul? I think that's that's the the answer is no. <laughs> that's the <laughs> I don't know if somebody would provide a different answer. Yeah. But um, I would like to make the to reinforce the point of the impact of that, uh, including rules of uh, data localization in the, uh, could have in the in in new entrants in the markets and uh, small companies as as my colleague pointed out before. But not only small companies but also the the new entrants, newcomers. So the, the impact uh, that it could have in innovation and entrepreneurship could be devastating. And uh, we don't know that today is uh, it's very easy for, uh, for an entrepreneur that is developing a new business that is based on uh, digital. Um, it's a digital work and it's, um, it's just to put something in the, in the cloud and is reaching out uh, the global community. So the and anything that uh, could affect the possibilities uh, is really killing the opportunity of any new business to be the next uh, or be things. So this is in terms of trading, uh, but there is another uh, point to make uh, with regard to the economic and impact that is uh, the same point that I made yesterday during the discussion on encryption, that is that digital economy is uh, 
is the oh, sorry the global economy today is uh, is mostly based uh, based on on things that happen on the digital world. So anything that we we do that uh, can affect the the free free flow of information and the security of the information that could have a really that's um, uh, impacts that we don't anticipate and really that the, the the impact on the economic stability could be huge. Thanks, Henriette Australis. Um, thanks, Rick. Um, I don't want to make a case for data localization, but I, I want to make a case against how it is being um, villainized. <laughs> and and, and um, I think that, that it, civil society human rights organizations have concerns about data, data localization from the perspective of freedom of expression and freedom of information. But if um, the opposite of data localization is being imposed on developing countries through trade agreements and the way that certain free trade and um, intellectual property agreements that, that have made the development and promotion of open source software um, difficult for them is being imposed on them, that's not going to work. I think that many developing countries look at, uh, they, they're attracted to the idea of data localization because they see opportunity in that. And I don't think, uh, even if I might disagree about whether there is economic uh, opportunity um, in data localization, the threat of e-commerce, the threat of a globalized um, e-market, um, platforms that are huge monopolies, very hard for new entrants to enter that, um, needs to be looked at. So I think that the data localization needs to be discussed, opposed, um, considered, in the context of the real impact of, um, of e-commerce and, and of the d digital economy on, on developing country economies. And they should be given a chance to, to have some influence and engage in that. And I think that comes to the, the procedural concerns. I think the, I mean, you've said it yourself, I think the secrecy, the lack of transparency um, uh, in how these processes are being discussed at the moment really just doesn't give anyone any opportunity to do this in a way that could really um, um, benefit um, developing country economies in a meaningful way, as well as respect and consider all the rights implications from data protection to access to information. Thanks. Uh, Ricardo Melendez-Ortiz has sought the floor. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you, Bill, for that introduction. So um, just very briefly, for the moment as we st get started on the discussion, um, it, it, I'd like to make two points. One is um, very much um, along the lines of what Marija just said, which is that it's very important to understand how the trade system works. So um, Lee Tanthill has said that we have um, today the frameworks to uh, address the, the, the concerns that we're presented with. However, as, um, as wise as the, the principles and many of the norms and the frameworks um, are, are, that's why is that the ones that we have in the WTO, so principles on non-discrimination and the frameworks on, on, on services, the exceptions to GATT and GATS that would allow for, for management of privacy concerns or, or security, uh, the point is that countries are not using them. And they're not using them when it comes to, to uh, protecting uh, uh, or ensuring access to uh, uh, data flows. And so the, the question there is, is why? And so the, the next thing I think, the next level, if you like, of analysis is, what is it really that we're talking about? And so what we're talking about is really how critical access, use, and protection of data is, and then in which terms should it be provided? Uh, and, and we don't have clarity exactly on what we would like to do. I think because uh, we're only now uh, really trying to understand the complexity of the issue. What I mean by that is that we are in front of an upcoming quantum economy, as some call it, uh, but one that is very much based on data. Um, so uh, artificial intelligence, the use of big data, in data internet of, 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 um, of things, all this will, will affect business models and will affect really the organization of production and trade that we have today. It will also affect obviously where the gains go. And all that, again, requires uh, a negotiation between stakeholders to try to understand 
what are exactly the terms that we need uh, to, 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 place, uh, to put in place. So my, my point really is we do have very um, uh, comprehensive and particularly wise uh, trade frameworks. I don't, I don't dispute that. But uh, are they really adequate to allow for, again, ensuring access, use, and protection in the terms that, that governments want? I don't think that we do yet. Mm, very interesting. Professor. Well, thank you. I, I fully agree with the colleague just mentioned that anti-localization should not be imposed on developing countries. We, we should think from the perspective of developing countries. And when we uh, think about what is the best interest of developing countries in, in this data flow um, process, um, probably we, we need to put it in the bigger picture. As Lee has mentioned uh, at WTO, there's a new very important program. It's called Inclusive Trade. It's also being uh, hotly uh, discussed at UN. It means we should uh, empower those disfranchised parties in the international trade. And especially we should lower the barrier uh, for, for the MSME and even individual to access the global market. And actually this localization requirement is really imposed in the local law. It's very costly to the MSMEs and of course to individuals. Just imagine how can you establish many data centers in, around the world. So this is a trade barrier. This is bad for the interests of developed countries. If we think about from that perspective, probably we have some uh, a second thought about that. Thanks. Mary. Thank you very much. Mary Uduma is my name. I want to say that from the perspective of uh, my own environment, data localization has many facets to look at. We have the infrastructure side of looking at it. We have the economy. We have image. We have the social, social angle of looking at it. We are concerned that um, the, the platform economy is creating, is uh, exasperating or increasing the joblessness of our young people. So if everything is done there and uh, we, 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 with our data, our, our trade, we, we don't protect in any form, then we'll run the risk of, what we are run, already running the risk of uh, unemployment, for our youth, that's for the economy. We have also the issue of security. For instance, as, as we speak, data from my country is being profiled sometimes. If you want to pay with your credit card when you buy in e-commerce, um, some of the organization will say they will not accept a credit card from Nigeria. So what should we do? It, will, it, will it help or it will not help? Okay, we talk of, uh, uh, we don't have data protection law in place. Meanwhile, there's a huge thread in between from the, from the internet. Our young people, our old people, people order their goods and transactions online. So the barriers are not yet there. We are just thinking now to bring, put in place local content, what we, we we say is local content. Whatever you want to trade with us or you are going to do with us in our country, um, there should be a local content to it. So why do we say this? Because of what is already happening. First, we have image problem. So data flowing from Nigeria will be profiled. We have infrastructure problem. So to manage the, 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 the process, then when it comes to WTO, our people, my country has signed you know, some aspect of the WTO, but we have, not, we have not given enough thought to this aspect, the trade. So Uber is in Nigeria, they are doing their business and carrying, you know, doing everything without anybody interfering. So there are some that will, that will develop um, uh, organically. But when it comes to the full process that you have mentioned, the access, the use, and the protection. We are still grappling with that. So anything that is going to be done should be in such a way that this, our own situation should be taken into consideration and barriers lowered 
so that we'll be able to play in the same at the same level with others. That's what, what I can say for now. Mm. Then as we continue to talk, we'll Good. raise other things. Thank Thanks. You. What I suggest is we take one more comment on this segment of the conversation from Thomas Schneider, and then invite Professor Drake to present the second part of the basis for our discussion today. And then we'll have another round among uh, our roundtable participants. Mr. Schneider. Thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody. I think we, we need to put digitization and the transformation that it, uh, and the disruptions it provokes in, in the context of, of another similar or related process which is ongoing for quite some time, which is of course globalization. And I think many people, and not just this is not just a developing country issue, it's also an issue in all of our European countries, depending on where, uh, on what segment of, of, of uh, income and, and, and education and so on you are. So many people are afraid of losing control, of losing their economic basis, of losing the world that they grew up in. And of course that causes fears. And politicians are afraid of losing control. Those who are looking for control, at least, uh, are afraid of losing control. And so there's a mix of, of reasons, some of them are legitimate, some of them are maybe less legitimate, that people have a tendency, or some people have a tendency to wanting the old times back, the good old times back, look for old models, i.e., in the case of nation states, go back to national uh, protectionist, nationalist regime. And of course, this discourse is, is supported by the security issues that we are facing, so that's a new argument to these people. They can say we have to go back to our national systems because the world is not secure, the internet is not secure. We can protect you only if you trust us as government within our borders. And of course that, that creates a, a new dynamic also to this. Uh, but I would say this is probably a fake, not fake news, but a fake security uh, <laughs> that, is, that people are, are uh, thinking that they, they will uh, get when they go back to old models and they will probably sooner or later wake up and see that they can't make the world uh, moving forward, stop the world from moving forwards. So the question is, I think the underlying question, it's, it's the same everywhere, how to create trust that people move on in a process and don't try to block it or to step out of it. And, and the easiest way or the most natural way is people need to see a perspective working class people, entrepreneurs, also politicians, they need to see a perspective to embark on a process and carry, carry it along. And one of the problems is that those who've just uh, also seen the uh, recent reports like Thomas Piketty's about growing inequalities in almost all our countries. Of course, the SMEs also benefit somehow, but other people benefit much more than the, the, the lower half, let's say, of society. And this is, of course, a ticking time bomb, if you want. If, if these inequalities continue, the stability of any political or economic system, it's not just the internet, it's actually our whole societies that are getting more fragmented or more risky <coughs> if we don't uh, uh, provide for perspectives for everybody. And I think the whole SDG debate about leaving no one behind is actually going in the same direction. It must be our goals to offer perspectives to everybody on all levels. And I'll stop just by saying that there's some elements, of course, some impo uh, interesting elements are in Bill's report that he's probably gonna uh, present us. And trade rules are one element to create trust. There are, there are many others, and many of them are, are actually uh, at least alluded to in, in, in Bill's report. Thank you. Okay, with that, why don't we invite you, Professor Drake, to uh, describe a little bit about some uh, you know, new uh, suggested approaches to building broader dynamic that can build trust. So my suggestion was simply um, to consider whether or not, you know, you, I don't think we're going to change what governments do in the trade policy uh, community very directly in terms of whether they go forward or don't go forward, but we can try to think about ways to open up the conversation more uh, and I think that um, a multi-track approach could be useful in this context uh, to help uh, address concerns that are driving data localization and the barriers to uh, data flow uh, and identifying what kinds of objectives are legitimate, legitimate and trying to figure out can we identify a basis for mutual understanding and, and building some consensus around what works and what doesn't work from a developmental and other 
uh, kind of perspective to try to nudge national policies towards good practices and perhaps uh, feed into the trade community's work in some measure by helping to shape the larger discourse within which trade policy efforts are embedded. So the suggestion here was perhaps to consider a three-track approach with not tracks that are completely disjoint, but rather, you know, on a decentralized basis, different people are going to be doing different things. But if they could be a bit more structured and perhaps interactive between the, those tracks, we might be able to get some cross-pollination of ideas, concerns, proposals, and so on. Next slide, please. So the suggestion put forward in the little paper that will come out uh, next month uh, is, uh, first of all, to be guided by certain principles. Uh, the Net Mondial principles, I think, as applicable. But beyond that, um, as a first principle for me, put the internet first. This is not to, not to play on Trump, but I think we, we need to think about how do we avoid doing damage to the underlying internet that we are all fundamentally reliant on going forward uh, for economic and social development. But some other kinds of principles as well might be useful, such as focusing more on the jurisdiction over and access to data rather than where exactly it's located. Can we try to ensure that people, that countries have access to the data that, that when they need it? Um, emphasizing the diversity of stakeholders that are impacted by restrictions, because uh, this cuts across all sectors of society when you inhibit, restrict, retard uh, the development of data flow and so on, et cetera. Um, engaging the concerns that drive restrictive policies and drawing from the full menu of global governance models because there's lots of different ways of structuring cooperation, pursuing cooperation. Next slide. So the suggestion was we could do like three tracks. One track that would involve non-binding intergovernmental processes, such as the work that's already been done in the G7 and G20, but it's been quite at a very high level of generality, trying to institutionalize the agenda within the different uh, governmental ministries and other uh, processes in NGOs, private sector, so on, orchestrating some coordination between the intergovernmental and the multi-stakeholder spheres, promoting transgovernmental regulatory cooperation, among, say, data protection, or, uh, protection people, consumer protection people, and so on. Importantly, establishing monitoring and reporting mechanisms to enhance the sense of obligation and conformity with non legally non-binding mechanisms. If we report on uh, departures from shared standards um, and everybody is aware of what's being done, this can encourage greater conformity with uh, whatever agreement there may be. Um, and launch uh, capacity development efforts. Second, next slide. <coughs> Multi-stakeholder level, we could also do more, I think, to facilitate the development of a global uh, community of expertise and practice that is interdisciplinary, that can bring together the different parties that have interests and expertise here, and perhaps establish some sort of multi-stakeholder expert grouping that could be a focal point for contact with intergovernmental processes, do its own outputs. There have been various... Uh, task forces and commissions and so on on other topics, and it's possible that this could be useful here. Creating parallel mechanisms through things like the IGF for broader public engagement and so on, and conducting expert uh, analysis and dialogue on questions of exceptions, of what is necessary or more restrictive than necessary. Uh, next, and finally, the digital trade tr policy processes themselves. You know, I think it would be useful to clarify the applicability of existing disciplines uh, and related national commitments. Lee has pointed out that the GATS framework already is quite applicable to many of these issues. Um, carefully consider what issues really need to be done through trade mechanisms versus other mechanisms. Clarify the relationship between privacy and data protection and in international trade disciplines because the fear that trade disciplines will somehow come to trump, uh, sorry to use that term, uh, but, you know, but privacy, uh, is something that's been driving a lot of opposition to uh, digital trade work. Uh, and I think uh, some, some comfort could be perhaps established there. Uh, craft digital trade norms in a more transparent and open manner. I think that you know, the process by which we devise the fundamental rules of the game uh, in the trade process could be opened up a bit. Um, and encourage participation of stakeholders in national trade consultations 
And ultimately, I think, from my standpoint, this is a personal view, if there is going to be digital trade agreements, uh, they should be uh, standalone, I would argue, they should be standalone rather than in intermingled with all kinds of other trade issues uh, because, again, this, this business of having uh, trade, having the openness of the Internet traded off for concessions in unrelated markets or mixed up with crazy things like, you know, ideas that uh, companies should be able to sue governments uh, for their profit margin, et cetera. Th this, I think, makes it very difficult to get agreement around measures that could help to preserve a more open Internet. So I stop there. Okay. Thanks uh, very much. What I'd like to do is invite the roundtable participants to, to comment on this. this is, uh, these are some ideas. They're in ferment, and they're, in, they're being tested with our, our community, but it's a really good chance to test it with you. And then we'll, we'll take a segment of our time here and open it up to the room as well as uh, online as well. Uh, I think uh, first, Torbjorn, did you still want to come in here, or would you like to? Yes, go ahead. And then I'll come in. Uh, Torbjorn first. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll start with the bridge over from the previous then too. Um, I mean, the first is to uh, to note that there, I think there is not a zero one situation here anyway. Every country has some kind of, if they have restrictions at all or, or uh, regulations at all, there are some kind of um, rules or laws requiring that some data need to be kept or um, at least kept in copy in, in the country for certain areas, even if it's just for certain sectors. And the other thing is that precisely because it, it attaches upon so many different stakeholders from business to private citizens, human rights issues, national security, privacy, law enforcement, etc. It really points to the need to have a more uh, multi-stakeholder approach to looking at what are the best uh, optimal solutions for, for protecting data and also uh, regulating, if at all, the, the flows of data across borders. And the problem we tend to face all the time is that we, we are a world of silos. So we have, uh, during the IGF, a uh, tremendous uh, uh, presence of internet expertise uh, in various areas. Uh, last week we had uh, the WTO minister with a tremendous amount of trade policy expertise, and seldom they meet these two worlds. And so the challenge is always to see how do we bridge these groups, uh, internet, trade, maybe human rights, uh, and other uh, dimensions. And I think the, the work that's been done in the EU has really been trying to capture all these different perspectives in, uh, in developing its, its uh, policy levels. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we don't have the answers to all this, but we would like to suggest that we need to explore every trusted talk shops that are available, and we would like to see ANCTA being one of those. Um, we have um, four alike, the Commission on Science, Technology for Development, and this discussion on, on uh, the enhanced cooperation. We have the annual e-commerce week that really is a cross-cutting discussion that can uh, feature different dimensions of these issues in a multi-stakeholder uh, setting. We have now several intergovernmental expert groups that deal with e-commerce and digital economy, that deal with consumer protection, that deal with competition policies and laws, which all have a bearing on these topics uh, and, and the implications of the, uh, the data flows. And, and, and we should also not forget that the WISIS forum is a platform that countries can use. It's, in the end, it's up to member states and the other stakeholders to pick the for us for having this dialogue. And uh, since we are here in the home of UNCTAD, I would like to stress that we are ready to support in this process. Thanks. Terrific. Surf. So uh, I want, whoops, yes, I, I want to uh, take uh, Bill's number one point, which is uh, make sure we don't destroy the Internet in the process of uh, trying to introduce some of these ideas. Let me just remind you of one of the most important features of the Internet protocol, that core layer. The packets are uninterpreted as they pass through the network, as they cross over the borders, and it's very important that we keep it that way because the interpretation of the meaning of the packets is done at the ends, uh, edges of the net, nowhere else. And changing that could rapidly destroy the way in which the Internet works, it's certainly its speed and responsiveness. So that's one place where we want to be careful. The second thing is that if we really care about protecting uh, the traffic from exposure and modification, 
then cryptography is actually our friend here, especially if we can achieve it on an end-to-end -end basis again. And so uh, I hope the people who are trying to wrestle with these problems don't forget that there are certain key properties that make the internet work the way it does now. Please be very careful not to destroy those in the course of trying to uh, achieve some other objective. Thanks. Marietta? Thank you. <clears throat> that really allows me to build on a, f on a few points uh, that were already made. I mean, the way I always look at a rules-based approach is precisely to avoid a destruction of the Internet. So I think we should not make a false dichotomy between, you know, trade rules if only they don't destroy the Internet. In fact, I think, you know, rules should be there to create safeguards, um, if, you know, if nothing else. So I agree, of course, we should not uh, destroy the Internet, but I think, in fact, rules can help avoid the risk of that um, if they're done well. I would would want to caution everyone to focus mostly on data flows when we're talking about trade. There's a lot more going on. Um, uh, Vin just men mentioned encryption. It's extremely important, but right now encryption is still part of dual use regulation, so of export controls, which we in the parliament have said it should be removed from that. It should be actually, you know, completely um, uncontrolled because it is so important for data protection and, and cyber security. So indeed, we have to think carefully about all the aspects of trade rules. Intellectual property applies to offline goods, also can apply to digital services and content. Net neutrality, we still have it in Europe. We're proud of it. Uh, we would like to see, we would like to see how it can actually um, uh, continue to be part of a discussion of global standards and fair competition in the global digital economy et cetera, et cetera, data protection we've just discussed. So those things considered, you know, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, but I'm not yet convinced that standalone agreements are the best solution because technology is so integrated into everything else, part of industry, part of production, part of services, et cetera, et cetera, that I just don't know how you can divorce the two. Uh, so, I, you know, I just want to put that question back to everyone else, like, is this really feasible? or not, uh, and what, what could it lead to? <coughs> then one more comment on the notion of multi-track um, approach and bringing people in to the discussion. I think civil society actors should not underestimate the impact that they've had on trade discussions and engagement over the past couple of years. I think, in fact, if you boil it down, the the impact of civil society, mostly protests, I should say, but still of civil society, has been extraordinary over the past couple of years. And what I, what I would hope we can now move to is a much more constructive and inclusive discussion on what trade rules should look like. And here's another point that I would want to put back to everybody. If we stick with non-binding on a number of issues because it feels safer, right? because it feels easier to agree on than binding rules at the moment because it can be more multi-stakeholder. We do have to think about what are the consequences of violations to the norms because the whole idea about rules or norms is really that you know you agree on something and there are consequences if you if you violate. And so fine, you know, binding or non-binding, but let's not avoid the question of what the consequences <coughs> should be in case of a violation because otherwise everybody will say fine, scouts honor, we're on this, we agree until they violate and then you have nothing uh, to put to put back uh, to these violating actors. So I think that actually with agreements there should be consequences in in cases of violation as well. And otherwise, if if the hard decisions are being put up uh, put put off to the future, I'm worried that there's going to be a lot more confrontational court cases, confrontational legislation to try to deal with sort of the lowest points of, you know, anything from tax avoidance to uh, non-compliance with laws in other countries. I think, for example, Uber is an interesting case study here to look at, you know, what what laws they're running into and who then enforces those in the absence of global agreements on some of those issues. Raul, did you want to come back in? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to be very brief for the sake of the participation. Um, 
I wanted to make a point that's, uh, that force that uh, uh, there could be some uh, some uh, cases in which uh, um, uh, data locally. Better say there are cases in which uh, the, the data is kept uh, local for good reasons, but they are not forced to. So we have to distinguish uh, between forced loc uh, uh, data localization and data localization. For example. Uh, the, for quality of services, and this is the reason of prices of access. This is the reason because we promote IXPs around the world for keeping the uh, services uh, closed from the from the users. And also with the um, growing of uh, Internet of Things, there are many applications. For example, if I have my my fire sensors connected to a server, I prefer the server to be near so the it doesn't depend that the international communication that the 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 fireman the firemen come to my house uh, very quickly or health services if uh, uh, health services if I have a health attack I I'm, I have something connected so that I want uh, the the doctors to come uh, as soon as possible to uh, to treat me so the there could be many cases in which uh, the the localization is uh, the the localization of the data is important and is a business opportunity and this is is a but what the first conclusion we have to take is that don't force data localization. And, the, and it is impossible, and I want to build over what uh, something that uh, been said before, that uh, forced data localization becomes impossible without compromising the Internet's uh, global reach. And this is one of the main uh, Internet values we have to protect. And the, with regard to this, the things that you proposed, Bill, and I think that the pieces you proposed on dialogue and discussion, multi-holder um, dialogue, and also the uh, creating awarenesses, and I, I think that all of this is important because in many cases, the effect of data localization is exactly the opposite of what is uh, intended by the people that propose that. And for example, on security, that's uh, some people use the, the, use the, the the reason, the justification of increasing security, and it is exactly the opposite. Having all the information in one single place is, uh, is increased the risk of the, in terms of security. Or even on, on jobs, and I think that uh, data localization, I don't think that it has an effect on creating jobs. And, uh, and in fact, it has the opposite effect because it uh, reduces the opportunities of the people to in, interact, in the, to participate in the digital economy. So the, and as I say before, it's uh, it's some of the in one of the main the biggest uh, um, companies uh, in uh, in Latin America is is Mercado Libre, is a uh, uh, eBay-like uh, um, market, and this has started. Uh, they, they reached all the, the the region. They reached out all the region. They work with all the regional community. If they have to succeed in one country in order to have the money for uh, deploying infrastructure in all the region, as I, the colleague pointed out before, that would be almost impossible. And this is one of the unicorns in the region. This is a big thing. So there's a, we, we, we have to trust that it's possible uh, to have uh, successful experiences of people participating in digital economy from developing countries. And so we have to create the avenues for them to, to succeed instead of uh, including barriers. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Fiona Alexander, and then maybe we will open it up and then weave in some of the other roundtable participants. But Fiona. Uh, thanks. Um, and apologies. I have a bit of a cough, so my voice sounds weirder than normal. Um, but maybe to respond specifically to the three tracks that are in the paper and that uh, Bill put up on, on the slides. Look, all, th all three tracks are good tracks, and uh, pursuing any and all of these would be good things to do that are mutually exclusive. Um, it's resource intensive, right? So there has to be some priority setting of what makes sense in the context of what everyone's doing. And maybe to react to some of the things I heard other colleagues say, but from, from my perspective and own experience, I think track two, you know, having these kinds of dialogues are, is still necessary before you can actually flesh out track one and three. Because I do still think there's this huge disconnect between traditional trade stakeholders and traditional internet governance people. And that's evidenced by several of the venues that were referenced where we could have these conversations, UNCTAD, WISIS Forum, other places. Internet stakeholders aren't there at those venues and don't even know about them. And so having more of a shared space to understand and then maybe pursuing the other two 
you know, after you have that shared space and shared understanding might be better to do, but I still feel like there's very much two distinct worlds, um, internet people and trade people, and they don't necessarily need to be that way, but I still feel like there's a big disconnect, so. Okay, just before opening up, let me make one comment myself on track two, if our colleague can put track two up. <coughs> I personally uh, think, and maybe this is, I'll pose this more as a question for discussion, that we're being, aren't we being a bit modest, particularly sitting here in the IGF, about, uh, you know, the scope of what's up there. If you look at what's up there, it's basically foundational. It's dialogue, it's research. But the internet, of course, has had multi-stakeholder decision-making about norms. And so, rather than presume, it seems to me, that only intergovernmental processes really would be the you know, decision-making frameworks, seems to me that fundamentally that second track could actually uh, make quite a contribution to beginning to shape uh, norms. They may not be uh, a formal multilateral intergovernmental norm, but let's face it, in this space, what can be quite helpful is a rough consensus or significant coalitions dare I say, dynamic coalitions that, that, that take, uh, that, that form a common view, begin to take a common practice, and thereby influence the behavior of others in this regard. So that would be my one question mark comment about uh, the framework. With that, let's open it up uh, to the room and online for uh, other comments and discussion, and we'll see if we can bring a couple of roundtable participants in at the, at the rear. Yes, and please just briefly identify, uh, state your affiliation and your name. Uh, my name's Jeremy Malcolm. I'm from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, just to follow up on the immediately preceding comments, there is in fact a dynamic coalition on trade and the internet at the Internet Governance Forum, and we held our first um, uh, meeting this morning, in fact. And um, one of the aims of the Dynamic Coalition is indeed to bridge these two worlds between the um, uh, trade community and the internet governance community. And, and we would very much encourage everyone here who's interested to join the Dynamic Coalition. You'll see that uh, we um, endorsed a statement on the transparency, uh, the improvement of the transparency and inclusivity of trade negotiations um, today at our Dynamic Coalition meeting. And um, in a, about an hour from now, I think you'll be able to read a blog about that on the EFF website. I noticed there's also been a blog published on the uh, uh, Intellectual Property Watch um, uh, website as well. So um, anyone who's interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to contact myself uh, or uh, my colleague Jyoti here um, as representatives of the Dynamic Coalition. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Lady in red near the rear of the room. Thank you very much. I'm Sanya from Third World Network, and I'm actually a trade lawyer. And I wanted to comment on the WTO's privacy exception, which has been mentioned, because it's part of the general exceptions at the WTO, which a 2015 study found was so difficult to use that governments have only succeeded once out of 44 attempts. And the privacy part is even harder to use because it has a phrase that experts have found is self-cancelling. You can only use it for laws that are consistent with the WTO rules, such as any new rules on cross-border data flows. So even the EU thought that this WTO privacy exception is a problem. We see in the Trade and Services Agreement, DG Justice, responsible for privacy, um, insisted on a better exception, not just copying the WTO one into TISA, so that held up the negotiations. And yesterday, the European Data Protection Sup Supervisor tweeted that data protection should not be subject to trade negotiations, and he makes it very clear that this is because the types of exceptions in trade agreements are not good enough, and that data localization rules could water down the EU's data protection rules and open them to challenge. And then just lastly, uh, as other people have already said here, this is a lot of internet experts, but as we know, even developed countries require data, local data storage for things like effective tax regulation, financial regulation, privacy, security, and these ministries and experts are not here in the room. So those other ministries, including the health ministries and so on, should also be consulted in any process going forward. Thank That's you. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, gentlemen here. Uh, thank you, I'm Parminder from IT for Change, an organization, an NGO in India. Uh, the first uh, issue was I was interested in Bill's uh, uh, slide when he said that we should focus on jurisdiction over data and access to it rather than its physical location. And I'm interested to hear uh, what kind of things Bill uh, recommends to do that because I think it's a good, it deals with one part of the data issue very well, which is about access of regulatory authorities to it. But 
one of the main problems about digital trade talks is that while digital economy considers data as a resource, the digital policy is not considering it as a resource. It only looks at its human rights angles, which are very important, but the fact is that data is both a personal resource and a collective resource of a, of a community, of a school where the data is collected of the students, of an educational district, of a country. And as a collective resource, uh, when Rawls says that there should not be, uh, I mean, forced localization, that's just tra people trying to keep their data resources to themselves. And you should read uh, African positions at WTO, which has talked about resource uh, data being a collective resource, and that's why they are interested in having data ownership talks and not only free flow of data talks. Now, why do we talk about free flow of data, but not free and equal access to data for everyone? Because that doesn't match the way digital economy looks at it. So these are the important questions, and the developing countries are not dumb that they don't understand it, but they have a framework to bring to the table uh, which is uh, not being accepted. So data ownership, free and open access to data is as important as free flow of data. And if we are talking all these issues, then real inclusion takes place, and then we can actually discuss these issues. But these frameworks which are dominant do not include these issues, and that's the problem of the people who don't want to discuss these issues at uh, global levels. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Hong, did you would like to come in? Oh, well, there's very quick comments on the multi-stakeholder model. Um, I've heard that last week at WTO ministerial uh, meeting in Argentina, uh, there's a new initiative that's been concluded between WTO, WEF, and EWTP. Uh, the third one is the initiative from Alibaba Group. <coughs> um, and, and in the press release, it said it, this is a, a public-private dialogue on enabling e-commerce for inclusion and development. Oh, I, I want to know whether this is a first step for the multi-stakeholder model, because this is only two stakeholders involved, IGO and private sector. Can civil society join this initiative for further discussion and research? The answer to that is uh, yes. It's uh, intended to be a multi-stakeholder process, multi-company, multi-stakeholder, international uh, process, looking at the enabling environment standards, practices, and indeed national policies that would be beneficial for the scaling of e-commerce. E uh, Thomas Schneider. Thank you, and to, to dare to uh, contradict Windsurf Vin and, and also uh, <clears throat> Bill, I, I'm, with all the respect to, to what you developed in the 60s and 70s, but I don't think we should put the internet first, uh, also not my country, but actually all the people, like the I can't just repeat, the leaving no one behind thing is, I think, not just words, but it's fundamental. I think this is something we should put first. And then a consequence of this may be that we actually should keep the internet unfragmented and at the disposal of everyone and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm with you in, all, in the consequences. And also, I quite like this, as I already alluded to in, in the beginning, I like these uh, free tracks. We may discuss to what extent, uh, really, uh, multi-stakeholder decision-making procedures can be developed. We have ICANN as an example that sometimes works better, sometimes works less, but it works in general. Uh, and we had the Net Mondial conference. I'm very happy that you mentioned it. I'm not talking about the Net Mondial initiative, but of the conference where it was possible based on a rough consensus to agree in a very short uh, term on fundamental principles on a roadmap um, which is something I think should actually be picked up and looked uh, at again more closely because that was the beginning of a new way of, of multi-stakeholder diplomacy that is not just discussion, but it's actually output-oriented. So I think there's lots of relevant uh, points that you have collected in, in these three tra tracks and also in, in the principles, but the most important one, try and be as inclusive as possible. And if people decide that they don't want to be part of everything that is possible in terms of digitization and, and globalization. Self-determination is also a fundamental right of people, and in particular, for instance, in my country, my culture, you can't force people to make progress. If they are happy in their valley with the way their houses look and they want to keep it like that, then it's their right to keep it like that as long as they don't disturb anybody else. So uh, in that sense, it, this is something that we need to keep it people-centered, but of course try to use the benefits that the new technologies offer. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Hill. Uh, I just want to start by noticing that the panel uh, has been heavily stacked uh, on one side of the debate, which is okay. 
we ran a, a panel which was completely stacked on the other side of the debate uh, earlier this morning, but just be aware of the fact that we've mostly heard one view. Uh, I think it's stacked because already it's framed wrong from my point of view. The debate is not actually about data localization. It's about whether or not we should have free flow of data. Some form of data localization is obviously legitimate. For example, tax records, financial records, and so on. Otherwise, you don't have any enforcement. If they're outside of your jurisdiction, you can't do anything about that. So as, as Richard correctly said, the question is how do we strike a balance, a uh, correct balance between free flow of data and protection of other interests, which I'm going to come to in a second. And my uh, take on that is definitely not in the World Trade Organization. It's not transparent, it's not inclusive, and Fiona, it's not that we didn't know about what was going on in Buenos Aires, it's that 66-0 of us got locked out. And that's a public fact. And why did they get locked out by the Argentine government on spurious grounds? And WTO never protested about that and didn't make much of a noise. So how can we create trust? Well, certainly not by doing what WTO has done. In fact, we should do exactly the opposite. So don't negotiate in secret for the benefit of a few big companies. I do agree civil society has had a big impact on the WTO. Anybody remember ACTA? And many thanks to the European Parliament, but it was civil society activism that led to the death of that particular monstrosity. And I think that we were quite influential in what happened or didn't happen in Buenos Aires, despite the fact they tried to lock us out. Now, I found it fascinating to hear that WEF is now billing itself as a multi-stakeholder process. I've heard lots of definitions of multi-stakeholderism and have even written papers on it, but I've never heard one where WEF would be in that category because as far as I can tell, WEF, and it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, I don't criticize it, uh, is promoting a particular version of neoliberalism, which from my point of view is just unabashed corporatism. Uh, Bill, your parallel tracks, uh, sorry to say this so bluntly, but you know me, I think they're just placebos. We need to tackle the real issues. So what are the real issues? The first one is that we need a global antitrust mechanism. And UNCTAD has started something along those lines. Uh, many, many kudos to UNCTAD for that. Then we need global data protection norms at a minimum. And we had a civil society meeting where basically everybody agreed on that. Convention 108 of the European uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Council of Europe could be a good starting point of that. And then we need a fundamental reform of the WTO if it's going to survive an implementation of the Doha development agenda. Because uh, WTO is, is so completely broken, it's incredible. And that's what's leading to phenomena that some of us don't like, or maybe some of us like, like Brexit and the election of protectionist presidents like Trump. And he's just one of many. There's going to be more and more. Okay. Data local is, sorry, I'm going to finish because it was so unbalanced, please. Data localization may be the only way to protect citizens' rights. We've heard the analogy about oil. Well, you know, if I own oil, why should I give it away for free to everybody else? And why should the country not get royalties on its oil? This is a crazy thing to ask me to do. But it's not just that. It's a human right. My personal data is about me as a person. Who's going to protect that? And you say, well, yeah, but if you localize it in some evil place, then they're going to take advantage of it. Well, guess what? But today, by not getting localized, some also evil companies are stealing my data or using it in ways that I never agreed to. Why am I getting all this advertising that I never asked for? We all know the answer, because those guys are taking our data and doing it. And I'm sorry, Lee, but small and medium enterprises have not benefited on the whole from the WTO agreements, and they will not. We're going to have the repeat of the same catastrophes we've seen in agriculture, pharma, and manufacturing, which again are leading to dissatisfaction and the election of protectionist people. Somebody said trade should not set norms. I fully agree, but it does. What about TRIPS? Everybody here know about TRIPS? Another catastrophe. ACTA, we managed to fend off. So, so it's no longer in WTO about trade. It's about negotiating binding agreements. And I ask people, why do you want to bring spam into WTO? Is spam a trade issue? They said, no, 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 because we like the dispute re resolution mechanism so we can impose things. So it's about imposing regulation and a certain type of regulation. WTO was supposed to be a level playing field. The results are just the opposite. It's favored big companies. We've had increasing inequality. Guess where it's coming from? Globalization, yes. And totally incorrect norms negotiated in WTO. If you ask MMSCs what they want, they don't want what's being proposed in the, in the WTO. They want other things. They want common platforms. They want reduction in certain bureaucratic things. And that's been well documented in UNCTAD's study. Again, UNCTAD is doing the right work. UNCTAD is the only logical body in which to discuss these issues, and in particular development issues. Nothing else makes any sense. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Rock and roll. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mary Uduma. I want to ask a fundamental question. 
can data be really localized in the face of the internet, the online, the, the openness of the internet, the online, the non-jurisdictional issues of the, the one internet that we are not going to be broken. Can data be really locally, um, uh, can it be lo uh, localized? Why I ask this question is that if we pass a law and say localize your, your data in our country, people will still do e-commerce. They will still buy, buy from Amazon, they should buy from, uh, from, um, uh, from uh, Alibaba, and Oba will continue to operate in our country and there are orders that are coming up that way. So I, I am a bit, I'm happy with this. And also, I want to support what Fiona has said. There's a disconnect, as far as I'm concerned, at the local level, at the national level. But at the global level, you might be doing something. But we need to bring it down to the national level so that those, discount, those gaps will be breached between the, the techies of the internet and those developing IOTs and all the rest of them and the business people, the trade. There are no, there, there, there must be a handshake. And this is the, the starting point, as I said, and, uh, and I, I think I, I believe this. And I also want to encourage that we take this home to our nations or our countries, to be able, our capitals, so that we'll be able to talk to those in trade, as well as those of us that know about the online businesses. We should be able, there should be some meeting point. Then build capacity between the two. Thank you. Ricardo Melendez Ortiz. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I think that that um, so I, maybe I mean the conversation has gone to too many places. But I wanted to respond to to Bill's proposal. That's one thing. Um, but just before that, uh, one of the issues I think that is coming up is the legitimate question of why negotiate frameworks and rules uh, under trade. Uh, so is it, is it trade agreements really what you need, the vehicle that you need for governance of, uh, of cross-border data flows? And I think that's a legitimate question to, to ask, and um, it actually uh, leads to, to, to the reaction to, to Bill's proposal. I think that in the, in the three-track approach, you have um, already uh, a mechanism that would ensure, hopefully, uh, that you separate what belongs on trade agreements and what belongs somewhere else. Uh, also, I don't think that anybody is doubting, for instance, uh, UNCTAD's role. Uh, UNCTAD UNCT plays a, a brilliant role, and there are many other uh, institutions around the world, particularly dealing with capacity issues. Uh, there are also infrastructure issues, there's the economic divide and the digital divide, all those things that need to be taken into account. Now, when, when you go to, to why the trade um, world, the WTO and trade agreements, uh, may want to be concerned with this issue, you have the simple response that basically all companies in the world today are digitally enabled, and they participate in one way or another in that digital economy. Uh, they do require uh, certain protocols, and they require certain principles of, for instance, non-discrimination to be able to participate in those, in those global markets, but also to be able to avail themselves of the opportunities of, of digitalization. That the reason why I think in Buenos Aires the, the joint statement of intention to start uh, talks towards negotiating rules in the WTO was signed by uh, 27 developing countries of all levels of development from, from least developed countries. So from Cambodia to Singapore, you, you have uh, members that have signed that, that statement is because their governments recognize the need for predictability, for, for certainty, in the trading environment uh, when it comes to cross-border data flows. Now, the, the, the proposal on, the, on track three there uh, also seems to make sense. Uh, you have to first clarify what's the, cover, what's the coverage today, what are the issues with that coverage as well. So, for instance, in the GATS agreement, then you need to find what other issues you need to, to really uh, put on the table and discuss. That's what negotiations are about. Through a, through a negotiation that includes uh, countries at, all, at different levels of development, 
and bring in there the ramps on, the enabling uh, provisions that would allow, again, countries at different levels of development uh, to, to participate. Uh, and then the question of whether this is going to lead to uh, uh, plurilateral, multilateral solutions, I think we need to, to, uh, to um, respond to that later on when we see, again, what's the content and, and what's on offer. Uh, no, again, I, I think in the, in the real world,
Shy? Let me just make sure the mic is on. It is on. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. I know we're late in the day today, but that won't curb your enthusiasm here or my enthusiasm to call on you at random times just to pull you into the discussion. Um, tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today for this panel and, and how uh, we'd all like to run it. First of all, just to make sure you're, you're on the right airplane, this is the realizing SDGs through policies enabling digital trade. And uh, th this is a theme of this workshop and it's, it's interspersed throughout the entirety of conversations this week. And what we want to do today is um, touch on a number of discrete components of, of that large issue. And we have a terrific um, panel here, a large panel here. Uh, and we're going to go through and everyone's going to introduce themselves. And then just to give you a sense of how this is going to flow, we're all going to be try to try to be fairly quick in, in interventions. And we have a few different areas, kind of ambitious agenda of what we want to get through. Um, between each section, I am going to, to pause and give a chance for any questions or comments, observations that have arisen in your minds during the discussion that you want to bring into this. We're also going to check, of course, remotely, um, hopefully for the remote participants. Uh, that, that will be something easy enough to do. So uh, keep yourselves ready to, uh, to jump in. With that, uh, let's just go down the row with, with the introductions. And Esther, would you like to begin? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Esther Pei. I'm from the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore, but I'm currently based in the permanent mission of Singapore here in Geneva. Uh, my background lies in free trade agreement negotiations, but primarily <laughs> dealing with trade and goods. So I might be speaking a little out of my comfort zone here today, but nonetheless, honored to be here. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Bay. I'm a senior counselor with the OECD, the Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, and um, I uh, work in a directorate uh, that's the Trade and Agriculture Directorate. And as you can imagine, um, digital trade, as is the case um, across all the directorates in the OECD, uh, anything digital um, uh, has become a priority area for uh, the directorate. So digital trade is an area that's included uh, uh, as one of the priority work areas. <laughs> Hello, I'm Karen McCabe. I'm with the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, where I'm a senior director of our technology policy and international affairs. And hopefully today, um, I am bringing some perspective from the standards development um, into, the, into the discussion and how we look at standards, trade agreements, and regulation. So, um, behind uh, uh, the front desk, and my name is Mark Yokozawa from Japan. Um, I do uh, some uh, business advisory effort to the Japanese government and the OECD and also the APEC and up to any uh, other places. And, the, uh, and I do some work on the uh, digital trade and digital commerce and digital uh, businesses. So, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Blackler with the Walt Disney Company, and I handle internet policy for Disney. I'm Helani Galpaya. Um, I run a think tank called Learn Asia. We work in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and we worry about economic development, particularly for poor people. So we work a lot on ICT policy and regulatory issues that actually affect their lives, including some trade. And hello, uh, Eric Loeb. I'm with AT&T. Pleased to be moderating the panel today. Good afternoon. My name is Audrey Plunk. I'm with Intel Corporation. I'm the Senior Director of Government and Public Policy. Thank you. My name is, my name is Christopher Yu. I'm a professor of law, communication, and computer science at the University of Pennsylvania, where I lead a project called One World Connected, where we are in studying empirically new ways to commit, uh, innovative ways people are connecting to the internet. 
We have a database of 750 of them and 120 case studies already conducted. We're going to begin a data analysis phase. We're also trying to connect them to, uh, to sustainable development goals such as healthcare, education, financial development, financial inclusion, and economic development as well. Among other things, I'm also on the U.S. Federal Communication Commission's Broadband Deployment Advisory Commission in an advisory capacity, but anything I say today represents my views and not the views of the Commission. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm uh, Carolyn Nguyen with Microsoft. I'm Director of Technology Policy, working on issues regarding Internet governance and a digital economy. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Hossam El Gamal. I am the chairman of the Information and Decision Support Center of the Egyptian Cabinet. And I've been working uh, in many areas for the decision support, but certainly uh, areas related to information technology. Hi everyone, this is uh, Müge Haseki. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the One World Connected project uh, at Penn Law School, and I'll share the tough questions of the remote audience with you all. Great, and Judith, our rapporteur. Great, thank you, Judith. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the great work that Barbara Warner from USCIB has done to, to organize and prepare for this panel. And thank all of you for being here and for your engagement today. So we're going to, we have a fairly ambitious agenda here. There are six areas that we'd like to, to raise and invite your input on. The first, as we talk about realizing SDGs through the policies enabling digital trade is the evidence base, what research tells us about the economic developmental benefits. Then we're going to move into discussion about the digital trade rules. We've got some great expertise here on matters of trade and trade agreements. We then will talk about uh, localization rules and the impact that they can have on realizing SDGs uh, onto the important topic of fostering users' trust in the digital economy, and then business responsibility and a coverage of some best practices. We will do our best to get through all of this. So first, on the evidence base, which is always an important place to start of uh, um, the, the basis for this. And Carolyn, I'd like to begin with you and for you to provide an overview on, on how digital services are essential to driving economic growth and examples where they're realizing many of the SDGs. Thank you, Eric. And um, so I just wanted to start out with a little bit of background in the sense that the goods and services that we consume today contain inputs from various countries around the world. However, um, that particular flow of goods and services within the, the global production chains are not always reflected. So if you look at traditional accounting of goods from an over, the, about an overwhelmingly large portion of trade um, versus services uh, is accounted for, so it's usually 80, 20, or 70, 30. However, if you break it down and, and take the OECD and WTO methodology, then more than 50 percent of the, of the trades is actually digital services. For example, in the EU, it's 58 percent of total export is services, and in the U.S., it's 55 percent. Uh, the ICC has a paper out that talks very clearly about how digital services are essential in traditional sectors such as manufacturing and agriculture. Let me just take agriculture as an example because it impacts SDG 2 in terms of zero hunger and SDG 8 in terms of decent work and economic growth. For example, digital services can be used to measure moisture in different parts of the field to maximize productivity. Uh, yield data in terms of how much fertilizer, pesticides, global market conditions, demands, et cetera. These are all um, capabilities that enable farmers to make better decisions and better yield. So I, uh, for further information in terms of, especially in terms of examples of ICT enabling SDG 5 in terms of gender and others, I'd like to refer you to the ICC paper on ICT policy and sustainable economic development. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Eric. underway, so if you could just talk about some more elements of the empirical connection between the investments and SDGs. Sure. The most often cited number, as you see in the World Bank reports and a number of surveys, is that 10 percent growth in Internet connectivity or broadband connectivity can contribute about 1.4 percent to GDP. And unfortunately, those numbers are done at a very broad national level, and it's hard to know very much what to make of it. And they're also not really done with what we consider adequate controls. So they look at before and after. And as you all know, all things being equal, you can attribute it, but all things are never equal. And so what's interesting is our project team has actually done literature reviews of the entire literature to see if a proper study has been done. 
the answer is there's a lot of anecdotal and suggestive after the fact information that suggests that's the case, there's literally no hard data at this point that demonstrates it definitively. Now, one of the things we have undertaken to do in One World Connected is we are using a methodology called controlled trials, which is the gold standard for social science research. It's the closest thing you can get to attributing causality to uh, internet connectivity as you can. And we're doing trials in education, healthcare, and in most importantly, in terms of economic development, which is we're discovering is a key element missing. The hard evidence to mobilize this outside of communication ministries and ministers into health ministers, agriculture ministers, education ministers, and importantly, finance ministers and prime ministers is not to describe the abstract benefits of internet connectivity, but to provide hard evidence that in fact this will advance goals and to give them some sense of the magnitude of the effect because when you see a prime minister, they face a decision where they have many problems and a limited number of resources. They have to have a keen sense of exactly what they're going to get for the investment. And so what we're finding is we are, there is a gap in literature, and we're doing what we can to push that forward. But there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that it does suggest and promote all the SDGs. Sure, thanks very much. And hopefully um, our work can help contribute to the current existing literature um, in this area. Um, as, the, as we at the OECD um, went about trying to develop uh, metrics for um, looking at uh, growth and impact of digital trade, um, we, we very quickly realized that we were not sure what, what we were going to measure because um, it's not clear what we all mean by digital trade. One person can, can mean one thing when they refer to digital trade, somebody else can mean something else. Um, and the normal um, common statistics and accounting frameworks that exist currently, um, we can't really turn to without clearly understanding what is meant by digital trade. So we went about, um, uh, in the very uh, early uh, stages of our work in this area, to try to get everyone to speak the same language, basically. So we developed a flexible uh, modular typology where we identified the how of digital trade, which is basically, is it digitally ordered? Is it platform enabled? Is it digital, or digitally um, uh, delivered? And also the what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about goods? Are we talking about services? Are we talking about information? And then the who, who are the actors involved? Is it business? Is it consumer? Is it government? Um, all of this, of course, is underpinned by uh, data across borders. And so we looked at different examples of businesses um, uh, out there currently. For instance, we looked at the Uber model where uh, there's a driver and consumer in the same country. There's a platform that uh, operates across borders. And um, so the question is, is Uber a matching service or is it a transport service? And Facebook, another example, it's a free social networking site. Um, there, so it's a free service. Um, and so basically, there is no monetary footprint there, but it gets its revenue through advertisement. So um, there is a footprint of advertising revenues, which is collected by GDP uh, statistics, but the data underlying um, the advertising uh, revenue is not captured. And so where there's no ac economic activity, there is, where there is no monetary footprint, um, it's difficult to capture those types of things. So what we are in the process of doing is developing this framework for measurement. We're still refining this framework so that we can be in a position to um, capture statistics um, and also come to a point where we can we can get to a point where we can decide or determine which part of international trade is actually digital trade. So basically, um, our work is in progress. Great, great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, so Halani, I found the work that Learn Asia does. It's 
very interesting in all of the kind of deep dive empirical work. And I'd like to take this from some of the broad-based approaches and look at a specific area um, to talk about some of the work that you've done on labor markets and, and the impact of digital trade on that as an example. So the formal digital trade in the way of IT-enabled services and software development is reasonably well documented for Asia, for, you know, contribution to GDP, anything from 7 to 11 percent in most South Asian countries, huge employment generator and so on. And this is an employment generation for skilled <coughs> workers with bachelor's, master's and at times um, PhD degrees. There's a whole set of digital labor that has, and digital economic activity that doesn't show up in these statistics, and that's what we particularly looked at, so let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, this is sort of classic mode for digital trade where the buyer and seller don't meet. Their work is mediated by a platform. Uh, it could be micro work where you're ad clicking for one cent or Amazon Mechanical Turk clicking and tagging images, all the way up to 300 to $700 of software development work, which is no longer a gig, but it's sort of called a project in this language. And everything in between, 5 to $10 for uh, designing logos, writing content for websites, and so on. And I'll quickly touch on sort of the very tangible benefits we've seen through national surveys in India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, in Myanmar, um, and also deep ethnographic studies, including like talking to 300 people of these, 300 of these workers in India about 70 of them in Myanmar, around same numbers in Sri Lanka and so on. One is that this kind of work is sometimes the only work for a lot of people in these markets because there, there's the concept of part-time employment is, does not exist with the big companies. So plenty of people who either do not feel intimidated for various reasons like transgender people or women who need to manage a newborn child or are caring for somebody are benefiting because they are able to sit at home and do some work. Classic examples are translations in Myanmar, which is a market that has just opened up. Huge need for translators. You know, 150 to 300 dollars a day of income or by page of sitting and translating documents from English to, you know, the uh, Myanmar language. Second, it's a huge um, um, uh, benefit in terms of solving an underemployment problem. So people who already have work who are not earning as much as they can or are not working as many hours as they can. And this is the classic online freelancer. While at their other work, they will be doing some online freelancing work. For example, in Sri Lanka, they will earn $150 a month on average in this statistic survey that we did compared to $80 a month through the national average income, so significantly higher. And this is not a very highly skilled bachelor's degree in computer science. These are people who've taken three to six months of coursework in you know, coral draw graphic design kind of thing. Lastly, uh, these kind of platform-enabled digital work, this is a classic solution to very sticky or underdeveloped labor markets. So in Myanmar, <coughs> where it's a low-trust environment, the, uh, the, where the companies don't want to end up with long-term contracts for workers, and the workers don't think they will actually get paid if they go to these classic uh, sort of the big platforms like Upwork or Freelancer. So these local solutions that come up actually create trust. So Chetsat is a newly incubated platform. The average job value is three to six hundred dollars, so quite significant. And what they do is they post the jobs from the employers. The employers have to pay the money into an escrow account, and when the job is done, the platform actually takes the responsibility for paying. So that's how they mediate trust. So they actually solve the friction in the labor market that exists. There's a whole set of challenges which have to do with international harmonization. There's a challenge of actually how big this market is and incidents, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, yeah. great. All right, before I go to the next person, just fair warning opportunity for audience intervention coming up soon. Um, and I might just call on you. So, uh, Karen, I, I just want to, we've talked about a lot of the very strong basis for being encouraged about this, but if you can just highlight some possible reasons to be cautious on, on the potential link between uh, ICTs to bridge digital, digital divide. Okay, and we'll do that. Um, I think it's hard to argue that um, ICTs would not help advance and help us realize the SDGs, um, to, to, to say the least on that. Uh, we've had many discussions around that, especially in, at the Internet Governance Forum. But I think we also need to look at 
the um, full ecosystem, if you will, of ICTs in the sense of the development of those ICTs, the standardization, the adoption, and the use. Um, you know, if we don't uh, are not inclusive, we may never really realize that. And we also need to look at the issue of inclusion. You know, we're talking about ICTs in the sense of, of, of really being inclusive and, in, in, you know, to your question about how we can bridge the digital divide and, and, and drive social inclusion. But if people don't have access to the ICTs or, and, and it's not done in a way that's addressing cultural or contextual challenges, then, you know, we, we do need to be cautious about that. But not cautious in the sense that we won't be able to accomplish it, uh, but making sure that uh, we're working in a broader ecosystem. Um, you know, when we look at uh, standardization in particular, you know, standards onto themselves are not policy instruments, uh, but they work in that larger ecosystem because they do help drive innovation, uh, market competitiveness, um, and things of that nature. So when we look at um, questions of how to bridge this digital divide, I think we also need to look at um, not only from ICTs as a technology, but again, as I mentioned, how it's developed, how it's deployed, adopted, and, and used in an equitable way. Great, thanks. So on the uh, discussion of the evidence base, first let me check, is there any question from remote participants? Not right. Not now. Comment, question, next. All right, um, we're gonna move into discussion about digital trade rules, so the actual instruments for economic development and inclusion. Um, Esther, you literally just returned from Argentina. Yes, Thank you for being awake. Um, can you just share with us uh, an overview on how e-commerce was discussed at uh, the 11th Ministerial Conference uh, uh, this, this past week in Buenos Aires? Sure, thanks very much, Eric, and I am trying very hard to stay awake. <laughs> no, but, so some of you might be aware that um, the WTO, World Trade Organization held its 11th Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina just last week, and e-commerce was amongst um, the topics discussed. Actually, e-commerce discussions at the WTO is not entirely new. Uh, it's not something that just recently took place. In fact, it took place almost 20 years ago. Um, e-commerce was being discussed under the structure of a work program on e-commerce. It started in 1998. And there was recognition even back in the 1990s that e-commerce will one day significantly transform international trade landscape. And the WTO, as the international organization dealing with trade rules, cannot sit out in this transformation. And it needs to play a central role in ensuring that you create this open, uh, transparent, non-discriminatory environment and a pre predictable one to facilitate e-commerce trade. So last week in Buenos Aires, um, there were two outcomes pertaining to e-commerce. One is a multilateral agreement involving all 164 WTO members on continuing e-commerce discussions under the structure of the 1998 work program on e-commerce. And also to maintain the current practice of not imposing customs duties on electronic transmissions until the next ministerial conference in 2019. Uh, the second one is actually interesting. It was a plurilateral initiative um, involving 70 WTO members, accounting for close to 75% of global trade. And this plurilateral <coughs> initiative really is to initiate exploratory work toward future WTO negotiations on trade-related aspects of e-commerce. And this plurilateral initiative was an effort by Australia, Japan, and Singapore and it was significant on two fronts. First of all, it is aimed at quickening the pace of e-commerce discussions at the WTO amongst a smaller group of members who are willing to do so with a view towards future e-commerce negotiations. And secondly, and more importantly, I think if you were to look at the participants of this plurilateral initiative, the participants span across geographies and it spans across development status and the bulk of them are actually developing countries. Uh, including Singapore. We also see a lot of LDCs participating in this plurilateral, including Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and as well as developed countries. So this really demonstrates that e-commerce and digital trade really represents and presents opportunities for countries at all stages of development and definitely contributing to UN SDGs. Thanks. Great, thanks for that review, Esther. So, so Mac has just discussed uh, the traditional concepts of digital trade. They're mm. bilateral, they're multilateral, they're plurilateral. You have some, some ideas right. in terms of a, a multi-stakeholder model for modernizing digital trade, and I'd like for you to share those. Okay. 
Thank you, Eric. Um, well, I, I have some experience in, in involved in the G20, G7, and OECD and APEC uh, negotiations, oh, no, the discussions, not the negotiations. <laughs> so, and uh, just, I, I just feel that the, uh, there is uh, some uh, battle between the uh, two major concepts. One is free and open, the other is secure and trustable. So uh, the, all the things in the, regarding the digital trade is the, uh, just the, uh, looking for uh, just some balancing point between this. Or, or just in, in other words, is that the balancing point or the priorita pri prioritization issues? So this is a big difference. So uh, the, for the people who want to be very free is uh, just, uh, uh, just requesting the WTO or the, or the negotiation process to be uh, as much as open free. And the other one is uh, so the, those countries who has a reason to uh, say something about that is the, they have to secure their people or they have to secure their, their local uh, development or SMEs. And so uh, this is the, you know, uh, the, 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 the fighting issues. So uh, the, I would urge uh, all of them uh, to just uh, say about the free and open first is good to think about that. So uh, the, all the industry representatives want, may want this. Uh, why? Uh, because in, to be secure and trustable, we need to open and transparent. So without uh, any good uh, data on the, on the, the, we have talked about the evidence-based, uh, we, we, unless we don't have the uh, evidence for uh, the good reason, for the, the good status of the, uh, the industry or trade status, we can't be secure or trustable. So uh, that is one thing I have to talk. And the, uh, Eric has mentioned the multi-stakeholder model. And yes, of course, an WTO wants to be multi-stakeholder, and IGF is multi-stakeholder. But the, uh, the big issue here uh, as a business and industry is just, uh, in, in a simple <coughs> word, uh, where is our customers you know, in this IGF? Okay, so uh, the consumer associations or uh, the business users as our clients my company is doing some system integration and the data center operation business, and the big companies in Japan and in, the, in other areas is, are our customers. So uh, where is our customers in IGF? It's very difficult to find our customers. So uh, the, the true multi-stakeholder approach will uh, require uh, to clarify who is representing what. You know. So for the civil societies, for example, uh, who, who is, who, who, what part of the civil society is coming as a civil society representatives? And for the business uh, representative, what part of the business and industry is I, I, I am coming from? So uh, this is a very difficult question, but the, we need to think about this to solve the, uh, the uh, trade negotiation multi in the multi-stakeholder approach. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Mac. Um, so, so Alan, you know, we're talking about the relationship between the digital trade rules and societal inclusion, and if you can just add to this discussion, um, digital skill development with consumers, and and the relationship between that and some of the regulatory frameworks. Sure. So, uh, frequently people ask. I work for the Walt Disney.